Uh, I will start with one question that I already have here from the, the people that is online. Uh, and, uh, and then I'll try to move to questions from the audience and then uh, I'll try to, uh, try to cover all the questions. I'm not sure if we're going to have time uh, to cover all the questions, but uh, we will try. Uh, and if there is questions that were not uh, answered during this, this time of discussion here, we can forward the questions to the to the professors and, and uh, have a later uh, reply on them. Uh, there is a question for Professor Murray. Uh, thanks, Murray. Uh, about the aggregation around man-made infrastructure, do you think the populations increase or they just concentrate? So I think it, 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 the questions are kind of implying an increase over time, perhaps. I think the evidence is suggesting that we find fish in areas of the North Sea that wouldn't otherwise be there if it wasn't for the structure, because the, the species that we're seeing would not be there. They are reef associating species. The redfish, I'm showing Sebastes viparus, is a species that would be found on the seabed. It would be found around rocky structures, deep sea coral structures. It wouldn't be in the North Sea if it wasn't for that structure, I don't think. We also see a lot of evidence of commercially important fish around the platforms, the gadoids, the cod, the pollock, the saith. And they're often very much larger uh, than, than they would be outside of those exclusion zones. Again, we come back to that term we've heard repeatedly. These are de facto marine reserves. I'm also reminded of a study we did a few years ago looking at BP's assets west of Shetland, this is the Foynave and Shahalian fields. Those um, are now within a uh, Scottish Government marine protected area for deep sea sponges. There's a sponge belt ecosystem. Uh, the sponges within proximity to the infrastructure are bigger. There are more sponges and they are larger. Again, it's because these areas are not trawled. So I think we, we see those trends coming through really, really clearly. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can have a question from the audience here. Hi, everyone. Uh, Leandro from Petrobras. Um, I, I was very interested on all the, the, the panelists, all the, the talks. Especially, I, I didn't know the, the work from uh, Sean. Uh, very nice to, to hear the, the novelties from, from Australia. There's lots of similarities with Brazilian scenario. And I, I would like to ask a question, starting from uh, Sean's point of view, but uh, open to all. Uh, in the in a oil field license to be exploited by uh, oil companies, but in the lack of a better um, def uh, definition of future use, how do you see the uh, stability of the environment versus the recovery of the environment? This, it's a, a mixture of definitions, a mixture of concepts, but in the lack of better definitions of future use, how do you see these variables, uh, how they relate to each other? Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Sorry, 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 sorry. Go sorry. ahead. So, how much of it is definitely down to recovery? We can make those inferences really from the historical data that we have. But in terms of stability, we have seen stability over time, and that's the benefit of doing long term monitoring. So, we'll have 10 years worth of data by the end of this project on this one platform. And we can look at that stability and any potential further recovery over that time period as well. From the work that we've been doing through Insight and, and other projects, um, it's, I think, interesting just to go back on that point I made in my talk about the baseline that shifted. So, you know, Sean's pointing out the information they had on Australia was gathered after trawling had started. And that's the case for so many places. We've shifted the baseline so radically. So one of the reasons I put Charles Wyville Thompson in, it's not just because he's from Edinburgh. I wasn't just doing a thing about Edinburgh. You know, that historical baseline is there in some parts of the world. If we go back into the dusty archives of our libraries and we look at what 
biologists were finding 100, 150 years ago, there are baselines. There are baselines in all kinds of parts of the world that we can look at and we can understand the diversity of the oyster reefs that used to be in the North Sea, perhaps areas off Brazil that were characterized by early biologists. If we go back into those historical archives, I think it's an exciting time to look at historical ecology as we that, use that to inform climate resilient future restoration. And to me, this is one of the perfect opportunities as we decommission old infrastructure and commission new infrastructure to get those decisions right. Well. Yeah, this, this issue of stability is very important and the baselines have shifted and will continue shifting. We are facing, uh, well, it's a bit of a cliche, but uh, global uh, climate-related changes and the ocean is uh, suffering. Well, look at increase of temperature of acidification. Um, so the ground is shifting and getting the baseline correct is uh, fundamental. Uh, I will insist on my point that I brought up earlier. And um, regarding stability, there are perhaps, this is a, this is a thought here, because we, we, we tend to look at fish or benthic organisms, but, uh, well, if it's a uh, primarily autotrophic benthic uh, bottom, it's okay, but primary productivity in the area should be perhaps used, considered as proxies to understand a bit more this, uh, this um, carrying capacity, so to speak, of the system. Uh, and I don't, I don't see, perhaps some of the, the speakers mentioned it, but I, I, don't, I don't often see uh, this larger um, um, phenomena or, or services or I'm missing a word here, but uh, like primary productivity for a synthesis-based primary productivity, which is, at large extent, the entry of organic matter in the ocean. Or let's say, let's measure how much is coming from land. What is the... Uh, how much this environment may support of really of, of, of biomass up there. And, and logically, the structure of the communities are important, otherwise the carbon doesn't flow up. But, well, it's just an, a, a, an idea for the trying to understand uh, yield and uh, stability of the systems. If we have a primary production, we should be able to sustain some, some productivity. And I think just a quick one following the thread, I think Sean's work on the novel ecosystem concept is really interesting. It's one we've also tried to explore in the context of a North Sea oil platform. So Sean, I might drop you a line about this. We had a go at seeing whether it met some of those criteria. And I guess it's a sort of philosophical point. How are we going, you know, a lot of science, scientists are people, right? We talk about being dispassionate, we talk about being independent of process, but we are people and we do have views. And I think it's kind of interesting to think where we sit on a spectrum between those that are extremely driven by you know, conservation mandates, protected area mandates, uh, restricting human use mandates, to those that are actually thinking as we are in society, we will continue to use the environment. So it's all about making those difficult, muddy decisions in the middle. But goodness, we're at an exciting time. And we've, for instance, work that, that's going on in the Atlantic program that's been generated from Brazil. So I coordinate Atlantic from the, the European Union. It's a European Union funded project, but we pay for work in Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, across the whole Atlantic. Some of the most innovative work about the, the shifting of baselines and the rap rapidity of climate change is coming from Brazil. The, the information on the fish fauna, the changes that Angel Perez at Univali is seeing in the fish are so fast. And we're now following that thread to see what the implications are for the nutritional quality of those fish. And it isn't, I don't think it's going to be a very good news story. It looks like the fish are becoming more rapid growing, they're less protein rich, they are changing. And the rate of change in the sea, the rapidity of climate change in the sea is stunning. This year of any year when we've seen the evidence of marine heat waves and warming at rates that perhaps we hadn't really believed were possible. Yeah. Um, perhaps this is even uh, 
faster in the tropics sometimes. Uh, the ecosystems are more close to stability in some places, and then, yeah. then you have less redundancy, and, and well, phase shifts are more likely perhaps. You have cases of phase, uh, phase shift in, in fish communities in the North Sea, well, very well documented, don't you? Yeah. And, and understanding all that alongside the removal of structures or the addition of structures is the key bit. We've got to keep that in mind. There's no point just doing projects that are based on the asset, restricted to the asset in too great an extent. It's got to be in a regional context. Ideally, that regional context set in a wider, I would argue, even base and scale understanding of the oceanography and the drivers of change. Because if we don't have that, we're not going to understand the implications of the asset on the ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, just a second, let me just, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll switch the, the topic a little bit for, uh, for a question for uh, Joe. Uh, Joe, um, I'm curious, how, how did you select the metrics that you used in your analysis? Uh, I, I saw a, 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 a a list of interesting metrics that you're using, and I'm curious to understand how did you select those metrics based on uh, on, uh, on your on the experience of your team or based on uh, on publications? Uh, uh, how can you uh, comment a little bit on that? Yeah. No, I appreciate the question, and the uh, the metrics that we use uh, a lot of those are things that that. Uh, are developed, you know, uh, you know, uh, in uh, you know in, in published literature, but they're also metrics that I know that you know, my team has experience with. Um, and when we think about ecosystem services, for example, um, it is, is I think we've discussed a lot. There's a lot of ecosystem services, and it's really going to be hard, if not impossible, to measure every single one. So the really the approach is let's identify. A variety of metrics that would serve as a surrogate to represent the flow of ecosystem services for that specific habitat or that specific platform. Um, and then, so if you have uh, a, uh, you know, if you use fish biomass or a combination of fish biomass and uh, benthic biomass or well, whatever those metrics are. Um, one of the key things is, you know, we're really trying to figure out what is the effect of different options. So that option would be if it stayed in place and just being very general, stayed in place or we potentially reefed it in place, excuse me, or we took it out for removal. Um, as long as we keep those assumptions uh, similar between the different options, you just want to be consistent between those internally consistent in your assumptions, because at the end of the day, we're we're just trying to get enough information to differentiate. It gives us information information to differentiate between the alternatives, and then so you you get to that point, and then that's uh, how you get there. But the the a lot of the metrics we use are metrics that have been you know developed for other platforms and you know, prior to uh, you know, a lot of the work that we've done, but. Uh, Really looking at those metrics and, and how they've been developed, and 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 again, I in, in that list, those are just uh, metrics that we've identified, and um, some of them are duplicative of one another. So, for example, fuel usage, um, it's duplicative and in in, in, in uh, 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 energy usage, just duplicative with the, uh, you know, for example, with your uh, your when you're doing uh, certain metrics in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, because your greenhouse gas emissions are going to be based on your fuel usage and the other things that are used to calculate it. So, you know, we, we show some of those metrics because they're developed as part of the process, but we really try to just focus on those metrics then that really serve to differentiate between the alternatives, keeping those assumptions, you know, internally consistent as you're comparing between alternatives. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to project, I've got a change in this structure that may affect, you know, any of the bottom half that what it's going to do and then what it's going to happen when I lay it down beside, or if I take it to recycle it, 
you know, you're, you're trying to just uh, basically look at look at it in that manner so you can compare those alternatives. Uh, oh, hello, everyone. Um, good morning. My name is Mariana Lima. I'm from the Wood Group here in Brazil. Uh, I actually come from the dark side of the force. I'm an integrity engineer, so I'm more in the technical <laughs> evaluation side. Uh, but we at Wood, we also we have a few services that we provide to our clients, um, and we have a few good projects uh, regarding disk decommissioning. And my question is actually for the group, because well, for my for my side, since I'm a technical uh, engineer. Uh, so I know there's been a lot of work done in this uh, environmental side of ways and sustainable decommissioning. And, and again, congratulations to you all for outstanding research. And for me, it was a very new topic. And my main question is because since one of our main projects that we have a lot of success on is when we combine environmental and technical evaluation because we have limitation on both sides and we have challenges in both sides. So do we have like uh, a group or a community that combine both sides? Because for example, we have uh, on, on this particular project, we have a, a lot of challenges in decommissioning because yes, the, the main objective was to remove everything that was there, all the equipments, all the flexible lines. And yes, we had challenges on the technical side, but also on the environmental side, because we have corals, we have marine life that we need to evaluate and, and um, evaluate the criticality of removal. And well, always have been this barrier between technical and environmental, right? Because normally the technical say, yeah, let's leave it, or yeah, let's remove it. But without all this that you guys brought today of knowledge and impact and what happens if we commissioning and if we decommissioning on the environmental side of ways. So, yeah, so this is my main question. If today we have a group or a community that combines all this knowledge and key focal points or key personnel with this knowledge to discuss and maybe to find the best practice and make the right decisions regarding both sides. Because I think that's the main challenge today on this subject. So, thank you. Well, let me start, and she would, would have to give you a very short answer. It's us. <laughs> well, Marcel is heading a, a project which is in phase two already, um, sponsored by Petrobras here at the university, and it brings up oceanographers, biologists, all the technical um, uh, staff or specialists. And uh, interesting your question, you're right. Um, uh, this communication across this variety of backgrounds might be easy to, well, someone just say, okay, sit down there and interact and come up with something. But it, it's not, well, it's not that easy. It's possible, it takes some time and it takes some, well, goodwill at least, you have to listen to people and meet and meet and meet. And uh, I think we've, we, we, we got to a point in this group here, and I will ask Laurelena, what's the name of the hub again, Laurelena? How do we call ourselves? Once again? Konit. Later on you explain the acronym. It has a, still, it has a name, it has a logo that you've seen around. Yeah, it was projected. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, that's the, perhaps the most well-organized fort I know. South, uh, south of the equator, no, because you have the Australians over here, but uh, on this side of the pond of the Atlantic, perhaps, south, down south. And it, it, it's working, and uh, we, we hope this will produce very good uh, results and really help decision makers to make the right decisions. Well, the um, approach that's being uh, undertaken is the multi-criteria decision analysis, all the math and so on, 
that 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 Marcelo and uh, Jean are mostly are leading, but it's a, it's a large group. Might be like dozens of researchers and uh, PhDs and, and, and etc. working on it. And it has been working, and, and the environment perhaps is one of the trickiest bits to link to the technical, or the social might be as well, but uh, the economical side, the guys made, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really putting them down, but they make a list of costs and that's it. We have to find out ways to uh, try to understand how the various activities, options will impact the environment. I give you an ex real example that we're tackling right now. Uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials. Oh, that's a frontier, uh, that's, that's a challenge right now. And there are others. But they come up every time. And the regulatory agencies, the environmental agencies are keen to know what impact is, so they can agree or not to the decision. And um, so this interface is very important, and the communication among all these uh, uh, various uh, backgrounds is, is absolutely important, and well, it works. And maybe I can add a, an example again from Scotland and the UK. Um, and what, I've got a couple of thoughts. In the UK, we have a Society for Underwater Technology, which runs a decommissioning and wreck removal subcommittee. And that's been a really, really good place for industry and academic science to meet. Um, I came across Abigail Davis's work on greenhouse gas emissions through that subcommittee. The chair has been a lady called Moya Crawford, who is an extreme, she's an engineer. She's an engineer, but she's an environmentally literate engineer. Today I'm wearing the SDGs, the UN SDGs pin. It's not some sort of, you know, that's what these rainbows mean. It's the, the, the different colors of the sustainable development goals. You know, she's quite critical of the SDGs. She doesn't think they will be tractable and measurable and implementable. Anyhow, I think they're rather aspirational and should be supported. But people like Moya are very interesting. And I wonder in Brazil, I'd kind of like to turn the question around a bit, where the opportunities you see to come together. So as well as there being things like the Society for Underwater Technology that's taken a lot of interest in this area, in the Scottish context, the government has resourced research pools which have allowed people to come together around grand topics. There's one for the marine environment called the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology Scotland. MAS now runs the largest marine science meeting in the UK each and every year. And each year we meet in Glasgow. And each year the SUT co-locates and runs its decommissioning and rec removal subcommittees activities. So in quite a small country like Scotland, it's relatively easy. You're a very big country with, with a lot, you know, with other challenges, but I wonder if there could be some thinking with the research councils and industry for sort of challenge-led opportunities. Because once you get people together, as you're saying, it starts to happen. And we're much more likely to work across the disciplines now than when I started in my career. You know, that, that's changed. And we're far, far more likely to work in an interdisciplinary context now than ever before. So that's why the last phase of insight is moving from the modeling through the biological and process studies to the human angle and the natural capital accounting angle. Well, uh, it's, when we visited you back in the end of 19, 19, uh, 2019, we went up to um, Aberdeen, and we saw that fantastic uh, center. It's, it, it's, it's, it's focused on the commissioning, and it brings together all these, all these um, uh, areas, uh, from law to uh, biologists to engineers. And that, that, if I'm not wrong, is half sponsored by the government and, by, oh, and also by the industry. And that's a, that was a fantastic example. I liked very much at the Berg University, of course. History, nice research. But that initiative over there, or up there, was very nice to see. Nice facility and, and uh, a, a way to bring people together to solve this type of, uh, of uh, challenges or, or problems we have. So the answer is, we need resources. Uh, I believe we have human resources. No problem. But we need more than that. We need, perhaps from the top, 
uh, ANP, I don't know, some organization that as, as the example that's happening now uh, uh, with the project that Marcelo is uh, coordinating, uh, we need initiatives that will last long, no expiring date, to tackle these issues. This will be fantastic. How do we get to an in, in structure and institution like you have in, in Northern Scotland? Well, that's a good question, and it's worth to discuss. Yeah, so just to uh, summarize, the, the objective of the question was exactly how y you guys explained, and, and this I wanted to know more about it. And, and yes, Marie, the, the main thing is to ask here in Brazil, what do we have in place, and if we, what we don't have, and what can we do together to make it happen? So, because uh, again, seeing all this fantastic work that you guys are leading and the fantastic work they're done here in Brazil as well, I think we've combined our minds, we can build a plan and having something that, okay, this is the kind of the way that things are the best or the decision will be best made if we do it like that. So commission and decommissioning will be less of an environmental, social, and also operational security impact. So thank you. And well, Wood is also very pleased to, if, to support in everything that my need, okay, for this uh, type of discussion. From which agency or, or institution do you come from? Wood, Wood Group. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joseph, maybe you, you want to complement on this question also because I think it has a lot to do with NIBA also, right? Uh, yeah, the, um, you know, a lot of what what we're looking at is you know when you look at all those different metrics and you're really incorporating a wide variety of disciplines in terms of the uh, you know the environment side and you know the uh, all these all these other aspects that we're looking at but you know a big part of that is understand and you think about technical and from things like technical feasibility and all those types of things there's a lot of engineering that goes into the understanding you know what has to happen in the campaign to actually implement all the different alternatives that you choose to analyze. So, so there is a, uh, uh, a, a lot of different, you know, obviously disciplines that contribute to the, uh, you know, to, to the final analysis. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, obviously working together and, and, and so forth, uh, you know, we, you know, we've worked with, uh, you know, operators uh, on you know across the world, but you know also integrate very well with uh, the uh, regulatory agencies as well, and 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 uh, tagging onto that also with the the universities. So we work with the universities in different parts of the world too, in terms of understanding what are the approaches, what are the hindrances. You know, how do you get past some of those hurdles? Because there's obviously a lot of you know in some cases there's differing opinions. So how do you look at that and go through that in a manner to, uh, you know, develop something that's uh, defensible and, and scientific and so forth. Uh, there is a, a lot of questions here about uh, invasive species here in Brazil. So, uh, and I think that uh, I would like to hear from Sean also how, how it works there in, in Australia and uh, in UK also. Uh, but uh, the, the question is, uh, some of the questions here is, uh, some coral uh, has the power to grow over uh, rhodo, rhodolite? Rodolites. Yeah, rodolites, yes. And, um, and kill them. Um, and the other one is uh, what is the real importance of the rodolites to the uh, marine environment? Right. Well, two big subjects, of course. Uh, invasive species, we, we have some specialists in the audience, I'm looking to Hannah here, which is uh, studying that now, is a PhD student in our group. But of course, we all know, well, any marine biologists or people dealing with marine sciences in Brazil knows about sun coral invasions and the problem. Um, 
that it may cause, it's, it's, it's widespread in the coast, not whole, the whole coast, for instance, that marine, um, um, the uh, Abralios coral reef is so far, as far as I know, and from what we know from our research, is uh, uh, sun coral free. Perhaps it was not able to colonize those places yet. Uh, we have not many structures over there that could work as stepping stones, perhaps. But on the other, on the other hand, there are studies showing that this uh, viable um, sun coral larvae may run down with the Brazilian current from up north to the southwest. So, well, all things might be true. Um, uh, it, it, it's circumstantial sometimes. It depends on the on, on many on many factors. But uh, the quite specific question whether the uh, sun coral can kill rhodolites, I don't know very well. Uh, in principle, rhodolites benefit from something. Uh, it's, a, it's not really funny, but it's interesting that in, in, in Portuguese we we say rodolito. Rodolite, and many, many people think it's because they roll. <laughs> it's the same root of the word. It's, they do roll, <laughs> but that's not why they get the name. <laughs> they get the name from the red algae, rhodophytes. Um, but they keep rolling uh, as long as they are those, uh, those uh, uh, rocky structures. And that prevents a lot of... Uh, perhaps a lot of uh, settlement and so on, because the waves keep rolling them up in there, and the algae is growing from every side. So it rolls so much that they get round, because they get sun from every side, until the point they are too big to roll, and then they get flattened. I didn't answer really the question, but uh, I, I, I don't know very much about sun coral killing rhodolites. I don't know very much, and I would say my hypothesis is that it's not very much. Well, they will settle on uh, on uh, they will settle on uh, on a fixed hard bottom and then compete and kill other coral and uh, so on. This this they do. But corals sit on top of um, of um, concretions of uh, ancient uh, crustaceous coralline algae anyway. Well, that was part of the question. The other one was? Um, I think now, the, the function of, uh, of rhodolites, well, um, I, I, one of them is the uh, uptake of uh, inorganic carbon into biogenic inorganic carbon. They fix uh, calcium carbonate. The same thing that coral do, that uh, corals do, that uh, microorganisms in, in the water column do, so they take they take carbon from the uh, upper layer of the water and fix it in hard structures. And that is carbon sequestration. It's, well, it's not deep ocean, so it might return to the atmosphere later on, but they are locked in the skeletons of these organisms for some time. So, and they do that. Uh, I showed some figures. It's a gigatons per, per year per square meter from one of these rhodolite beds. So this is something important. Rather than that, uh, more than that, they, they are photosynthesizers, they, so they also produce organic carbon that will feed up uh, the food web, fish. Uh, small organisms will feed on them, live associated, and then fish will eat those small organisms, and you have fish and, and, and larger organisms. And uh, they also uh, bring three-dimensionality to the to the seabed, which is creation of new habitats, microhabitats. And that's another benefit, uh, breeding grounds for some species and, and so on. You know, small fishes hide on, 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 those, uh, on those structures. There are some fishes, and there might be, some, some, there's, if there is any, any other more specialized biologists, correct me please, uh, marine biologists. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not a fish biologist, but from my, my coffee uh, break talks with Rodrigo, we always discuss these things. Uh, some fish actually uh, make nests of these rhodolites. They, they push them together and make some protection uh, place to, to breed and so on. 
So there are many, many advantages of having those uh, structures, structures uh, preserved or understanding uh, the, 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 the full role. Uh, when we do, another thing, when we do uh, oxygen profiles on, on, on um, some, some places in sea, we lower down our sensors or we fix a sensor down there and there's considerably more oxygen down there than on the top. So they are photosynthesizing. During the day, you get an increase in oxygen as well. Well, well, they do photosynthesis. That's not very surprising, but we're measuring how much they do that, right? Well, it's some, some uh, uh, ecological importances. There may be more. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shun, maybe you can comment on, uh, on invasive species and the interaction of them with the man-made structures in Australia. Yeah, it's not something that's really been looked at in Australia much as yet. Uh, we do have the sun corals on our platforms here. As far as I know, the species we have aren't invasive, but we're seeing them in incredibly high abundance, up to 100% cover over a 10 meter depth range on some of the platforms. Uh, um, but my main concern with invasive species and something that isn't really talked about a lot is in terms of decommissioning is if these platforms are to be removed, they generally, and especially in Australia, need to be towed somewhere else to be decommissioned. And that can obviously spread species to locations where they wouldn't have been previously. So, for example, where we work, they would have to probably be towed from northwest Australia where they're situated now down to around the Perth area, which is kind of on that border of temperate and tropical at the moment with more incursions of tropical species. So towing oil platforms full of tropical species down here could accelerate the introduction of those tropical species into this region as well. So I think that's something that needs to be considered in terms of decommissioning is the spread of species that wouldn't necessarily be invasive otherwise. Point, and it's one that I'm discussing with regulators in Scotland when it relates to the concept of using deep sea cold water corals to actively restore areas that have been damaged by fisheries. One of the concerns that will come back quite rightly actually is, is there a risk of introducing an invasive through that process? So we will go through that very analytically. Um, as I've already mentioned, we're working within the same water body, the same water mass. We're geographically very close. And we know that at least when it comes to the genetics of the natural coral that occurs on those platforms, Lophelia pertusa, Desmophyllum pertusum, it's a well mixed pan mictic population across the Northeast Atlantic. The Redress Consortium includes geneticists at the Roslyn Institute of the University of Edinburgh who will be very focused on that issue. Now, of course, can I put my hand on my heart and say there is no risk at all that any tiny parasite, foraminiferan, minute organism might be translocated to an area where it might not have been, that's going to be hard to do. So that's part of the Redress Consortium to go in to look at that science and to be very analytical about that. So each case we have to look at on its merits, but what I'm hoping is that we can be proactive and look forward to active restoration of the deep seas, in this case, taking profit from a decommissioning uh, activity and in industry in an area very, very close by. We wouldn't really be having these arguments in the terrestrial environment. We do tend to plant oak trees. We do tend to prevent animals eating those trees. We actively restore and re rebuild. We give nature a helping hand. And that's really the only case that we're making here, that we start to do that in the deep sea. And a, and a quick one, final one, I think credit to the European Union and the European Commission who've put real you know, significant taxpayer resources against this. There's in fact a mission up in Europe to restore our oceans and waters. And there's a significant investment that's going into this area of research, not just in the deep sea, but the shallow seas and across our terrestrial environment as well. Right now, uh, I was going to, to make a comment uh, regarding the invasive, invasive uh, sun coral and the decommissioning activities. We faced that, uh, well, we have to tackle that, uh, that uh, potential uh, impact uh, in our methodology, in our framework, and uh, well, based on literature and uh, well, the studies we have over here, and, and and in other parts of the world as well, there is this thing that how much can you handle those uh, structures as as uh, Sean? 
mentioned. Uh, and depending on the depending on the uh, option you are using to decommission, let's say reverse reeling uh, of of pipes that are impregnated or, or encrusted with with, with with some coral, you might during the process to spread them and provoke uh, provoke larval. Uh, um, production and, uh, and uh, worsen the, the case. So this, this, uh, the, the amount of handling uh, is being, we have been considering that in our, in our framework. So the less handling, the better. And of course, one option, if they are in cold water, if the structure is up in a, in a, in a deep water column, raise them down and they probably will die. So that's not a big, big issue. But in shallow waters, uh, handling too much may, may be a problem to um, increase their spreading, actually. So this should be, should be considered. Just this observation. Thank you, Paul. OK, uh, unfortunately, I, have, I still have a lot of questions here, but uh, we need to, uh, to finish this discussion section here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the presenters here, uh, it was the speakers here. Uh, it was fantastic to hear your presentations, all of you. Uh, it was really an interesting morning here. Uh, uh, it was very good to see different situations in different parts of the globe and see similar challenges that we are facing uh, to understand what is the best solutions to do and how to monitor, how to understand the interaction between uh, these man-made structures and the, the marine environment. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, all the staff here at COPE for uh, their help to make this uh, hybrid event happen. Uh, I can see that it's quite hard to make it happen because uh, because of all the interactions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to also thank to the to our staff in the project that was uh, organizing this here, uh, Laurenena, Julia, Sami, Hannah, and all the others that I could not mention here. Thank you very much for your efforts to make this happen. And. Uh, at last, I would like to uh, thank Petrobras for the support, not only in organizing this, but also the continuous support to our research projects here, which is quite very important to, to this. And of course, ANP, uh, be, uh, without ANP, all this uh, infrastructure here would not be happened, so it would not be possible. So thank you uh, to all of you for your support. So with this, uh, I finish our event today. So please uh, keep track of CONIDES. Uh, we will have other um, seminars, scientific seminars like this one uh, in the future. Thank you.